Let's start. E aí, pessoal, bom dia, sejam bem-vindos aí. Bom dia, não, boa noite, né? Sejam bem-vindos aí a mais um episódio do Super Riff. E hoje nós temos aí um convidado muito especial, o senhor Lu Ecos, o CEO da Tropic Marine, radicado nos Estados Unidos. Ele é o cara no assunto que nós vamos tratar, tratando aí, principalmente na parte química. Então, antes de nós continuarmos, eu, se vocês não são inscritos no canal, quero pedir para vocês se inscreverem no canal e compartilharem o link da nossa transmissão ao vivo. Vamos prestigiar aí esse ilustre convidado. Mais uma vez, a entrevista será conduzida em português e em inglês. Eu vou transmitir primeiro a mensagem em português e depois eu vou estar passando em inglês. E nós mudamos um pouquinho na didática. Agora nós vamos ter perguntas mais claras e vamos estar uh, limitando uh, a maior parte do tempo pessoal para partirmos para questões mais técnicas, né? já que nós temos uma pessoa com um expertise muito grande. Então, vamos lá, vamos compartilhar e sejam bem-vindos. Ok, guys, so welcome again for our channel, for our Super Heave channel. Today we have a really, a really honor, a great honor that we have it here is Mr. Lou Ecos, the CEO from Tropic Marine. We are going to change a little bit of the didactics of these meetings, of these interviews. We are going to get a small part for the personal, for the, the starting part, for the history part, and we're going to go a little bit more deep on the technical details because Mr. Lou is, is the guy to talk about chemistry with us. So, Lou, Thank you very much for being here with us. And uh, man, it's a great honor to have you here. Thanks, Ido. I'm really happy that we were able to put this together. And uh, um, I, I hope that, uh, I hope we can answer some questions that people might have, have some fun at the same time. Pessoal, muito obrigado. Fico muito feliz por estar aqui. E a gente fica feliz por ter conseguido fazer esse, esse encontro. E vamos tentar responder o máximo de perguntas e se divertir um pouquinho. Então, Lu, como que tu começou no hobby? Como foram os teus primeiros aquários? Uh, o que tu fez? Qual a tua formação profissional? E como que tu começou a tua carreira na Tropic Marine? So, Lou, let's start with a few personal informations. How your trajectory started? How you got into the hobby? How was uh, your first reefs, uh, university career, and how you started in Tropic Marine? Wow, that's a mouthful. Um, in university, I didn't study anything to do with marine biology or chemistry. Um, my studies in university were relation, uh, in relation to artificial limbs and braces for the body, mm -hmm. uh, orthotics and prosthetics. And that was my career uh, until things changed. <laughs> uh, so I, I graduated with that degree and I worked in that industry for quite some time. Um, and uh, through a whole crazy course of events, I ended up doing something totally different, just to show you that you always can use whatever you learn in your next career. Um, and um, uh, I didn't really, I was a late bloomer when it came to reefs. Um, mm -hmm. As a young child, I always had, you know, a tank with guppies uh, that I didn't take care of the way I should. And uh, that was my, my history in aquariums, just like every other young kid. Um, então, ele, ele, a formação dele acadêmica não tem nada a ver com aquário, nada a ver com química também. Ele se formou em ortopedia e fabricação de próteses, e isso foi boa parte da carreira dele. Então, ele ainda ilustra que todo conhecimento pode ser trazido para uma próxima carreira. Ele, quando criança, tinha aquário com gubis, com a grande maioria, e começou posteriormente com, 
com os aquários marinhos. So, uh, really was in my 30s that I started to get into back into reefs and aquariums. There was a guy that I knew that had a aquarium store and uh, mm -hmm. and my my first system. This was back in the days when we didn't have all of the technology that we have now. And my first system was three tanks, um, a 90 gallon predator tank uh -huh. that had a moray, a zebra moray eel and a mini otis grouper, a community tank that had pretty much every type of commonly available freshwater fish you could find. The community tank was 150 gallons. And then the reef was also 150 gallons, was mixed SPS and LPS. And in those days, we only had metal halide lighting. And I built all the lighting and the timing and the filtration system I built. I made my own protein skimmer. It was a pretty crazy setup. When uh, was that, Lou? It was in the 90s? Uh, that was in the 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 late 80s the late 80s yeah and and so there really was not much available so in those days you read and then you build something I see então ele começou com aquários marinhos já quando ele tinha aproximadamente 30 anos que ele voltou a ter a, o hobby do, do aquarismo ah, um dos tanques era um tanque com uma moreia zebra e um gooper que se davam muito bem Outro era um tanque comunitário de água doce que tinha 150 galões, aproximadamente 500 litros, 600 litros. E um outro tanque com animais marinhos. E naquela época não tinha nada de material disponível, tudo tinha que se construir. E era um tanque com HQI que ele mesmo construiu, então ele lia e fazia. Ok. Uh, so, that was my system and everybody knew that I had that and it was really interesting to people. Um, and then um, I was married at the time. I was uh -huh. my first wife. And uh, I went through a divorce and I kind of lost my way a little bit with my businesses. And um, a friend of the family's knew uh, Mr. Carl Kerner. And Carl Kerner used to be with Krupps, the coffee machines and the mm -hmm. coffee makers. He used to be with Krupps um, and he left Krupps and he, a lot of other stuff happened. And then he bought Tropic Marin in Germany. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to make a more formal US office. And my friend knew him. So that's how the connection was made. And Mr. Kerner called me and we met and then I started handling the U.S. and Canada for him. And he's also North American? Uh, no. No, no, no. He's European. Um, okay. But um, he has since also sold the company now to, mm -hmm. to new ownership, uh, Mr. Marcus Wengel. And, and uh, um, we are having a lot of fun um, because the company's made some, some amazing steps uh lately because when there's new owners you know new stuff happens and so it's really been very exciting and uh although i've been with tropic marin now for over 23 years um i'm seeing things happen with the company worldwide now that we've been trying to make happen for a very long time tropic marin was a family company and then it was sold to to Mr. I'm sorry, um, what, what was the name? The, the, the company was started by Dr. Hans Biener. Um, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Biener was one of the very first people in the world to, uh, to say, hey, we could take everything that's in ocean water and, and make a mixture of it so that we could make a very clean form of ocean water. And if you read back into the history of saltwater aquarism, um, you'll find that Dr. Hans Biener was one of the very first guys to do that. Um, and Tropic Marin, uh, there's some, some discussion as to whether it was Tropic Marin or Instant Ocean that actually made it to the market first. Um, mm -hmm. But those were the two salts that first became available commercially uh, to make ocean water. Então, assim, a Tropic Marine, pessoal, começou com o Dr. Hans Biner, 
ele foi o fundador da, da empresa, e existe uma discussão entre se eles ou a Instant Ocean foram os primeiros a criarem o, o sal sintético, que revolucionou o aquarismo marinho, né? A essa empresa, ela foi vendida por uma pessoa em comum, eu não recordo direitinho o nome, eu acho que era Marcos, e esta pessoa tinha em comum a uh, amizade com uma pessoa que era amigo do Lu. E foi assim que eles se conheceram e assim que ele entrou na empresa 23 anos atrás. É a Tropic que foi vendida novamente, posteriormente, e agora está vendo uma, uma grande mudança no mercado aí, porque toda vez que muda o dono, vem ideias novas, projetos novos, e isso faz, promove o crescimento e desenvolvimento. So, uh, Hans Biner, he sold the company to, to that? To Mr. Company. Carl Kerna. So, oh, Hans okay. Biner had the company for many, 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 many years, for, um, I think, close to 48 years, maybe, oh. um, almost 50 years. And then uh, uh, Mr. Kerna bought the company. And, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, a couple of years ago, um, and, and I had worked with Carl for, uh, he owned the company for 22 years or 20, oh. 21 or 22 years. Um, and then he just recently, a few, a few years ago, sold it to this new ownership um, who have uh, really kind of done some new things with the company. And it's, right. it's really been fun to see the, the company and, uh... make, make the changes. And look, this company owners now, it's a group of investment. They have other business as well, or they only focus on Tropic Marin? Um, they're pretty much focused on Tropic Marin. Um, it's not an investor group. Um, the, um, Herr Rangel, Mr. Marcus Rangel, one of the owners is a chemist. Uh, and so it's, uh, there's a, um, uh, and he was in an industry that was similar to this. So, um, They're, they're not like, um, like an investment group. They're, they're owner manager workers, you know, they're, they're, in, they're in the company managing it. All, all of the owners are in the company managing it on a daily basis. And I suppose it happened maybe only a couple of years ago. The sale from Mr. Kerner to the new group. Yes. About, uh, about two and a half years ago now, I think. Há dois anos e meio atrás, a Tropic foi vendida novamente. Foi vendida do Carl, que era o conhecido do, do Lu, no qual ele trabalhou com ele durante 21, 22 anos. E foi vendido agora para Marcos, que é um químico que trabalha dentro da Tropic Marine e se dedica exclusivamente para o negócio. Então, todo o corpo empresarial está ali dentro e é assim que eles estão conseguindo promover um crescimento maior. And uh, the operations are still focused uh, in the U.S. or they are more in the back into Germany again? Oh, they've always manufacturing has always been in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. All, all of, there is no manufacturing outside of Germany. So mm -hmm. if it's a Tropic Marin product, it was manufactured in Germany, um, and uh, um, uh, it's uh, it, it's always been a product that's shipped from Europe over here to mm -hmm. the U.S. The main market for Tropic Marine is still USA, or you can say it's more global now? Oh, gee, I really don't know because we just handle the United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Tropic Marine is sold, it's all sold all over in China, in Australia, and I mean, everywhere. Um, and certainly in Europe, um, it's, it's, I believe it's the leading brand in Europe. I, I don't know 100%, but I'm pretty sure that it's the leading, the leader of the category in Europe. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, the US is a huge market, um, but at the same time, we really own a very, very small chunk of that market. Um, I'd love to have more, um, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but we're, you know, we're working on it. Um, but there's a lot of salt companies. So each one has kind of a small piece of the pie. Então, as operações, todas elas, a fabricação toda sempre na Alemanha. E o Lu, ele é responsável pelas vendas nos Estados Unidos e no Canadá. Dessa operação. Então, ele não sabe precisar o quanto isso representa globalmente, mas ele acredita que sim, a Tropic Marine é líder de mercado na Europa, na Alemanha. E a China também é um mercado muito forte para eles. And uh, one last question about the company. Uh, 
how uh, how many people you handle over there? Because I have thought that uh, you also responsible for the America business. So Brazil and South America are handled from other person from the company. Yeah, we we only handle um, the United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of an interesting arrangement because everybody thinks that we're sales reps. Uh, they call them sales representatives. Mm -hmm. um, when, when we're not, um, we're actually the U.S. office of the German manufacturer, Tropic Marin. Um, so it's, it's, it works a little differently. Um, so we're the U.S. office and we handle North America for him, uh, for them. Um, but all of the rest of the countries are handled directly by Germany. So oh, I, I don't I don't know what the like what the leading market is or whatever um, I, we because we really only do U.S. and Canada. Então eles são os representantes da empresa. Eles são oficialmente funcionários da empresa. Não são representantes comerciais. São representantes da empresa e eles cuidam somente do mercado do mercado americano e canadense. Lu. So, as I mentioned to you before the meeting, ah, então, Lu, como eu falei com você antes da, da entrevista, nós juntamos perguntas de várias pessoas aqui que têm uma voz dentro do nosso hobby aqui no Brasil. E eu vou estar tá te fazendo essas questões que eu acredito que todo mundo vai ter muita curiosidade em escutá-las. So, Lu, as I mentioned to you before we start our meeting, I have a compiled a few questions from people that are well known in Brazil, being hobbies, former persons from the from the industry, and mm -hmm. also YouTubers, and everyone is quite curious about the questions. So let's start. A primeira questão é do Jeff Studs. O Jeff é o representante da Triton aqui no Brasil. Uh, e a pergunta é a seguinte, cada espécie de coral tem o seu nível de consumo de elementos traço. Ainda, tem, ainda existem vários, uh, vários robistas que utilizam o Original Balling Components, que é o programa de reposição de elementos de balling da Tropic Marine, uh, com tanques já maduros, onde já existiam um desbalanço iônico. Como isso é controlado e mantido sem uma grande troca d'água? Por favor, qual é o ponto da Tropic Marine e a sua visão pessoal sobre isso? Lu, each coral species might have their own rate of minor trace elements com, minor elements consumption. Also, there are reefers that adopt the original balling components with mature tanks and already having improper ionic balance. How is this fixed and or controlled without a 100% water exchange? Share us Tropic Marine and your personal view about it. Okay, so um, this brings up a point that is very often misunderstood about balling. Hmm. So I think we have to go to this point first and explain this point so everybody understands that and then we can answer the question easier. Nós vamos voltar um pouco no tópico e nós vamos abranger ainda o que se trata de balling para que assim a gente consiga responder essa questão. Okay, so um, I believe that the person asking this question assumes that the balling method supplements for these trace elements. That's not totally correct. In the, go ahead. Ah, então, a, acredito que a pessoa que perguntou isso daí, ela assume que o original balling components, a reposição de elementos, traz consigo todos os elementos traço. E isso não é bem uma verdade. Ok. The part A of balling gives you the calcium chloride. The part B of balling gives you the sodium bicarbonate. Ok. The animals will use the carbonate, leaving the sodium. And the animals will use the calcium 
leaving the chloride. Okay. So, so leftover from the A and B, once the animals take what they want, is sodium chloride. A parte E é carbonato de cálcio. Os animais vão usar o cálcio e vão deixar o carbonato. A segunda parte é bicarbonato de sódio. Os animais vão usar o bicarbonato e vão deixar o sódio. E a sobra disso é uh, sodium chloride, cloreto de sódio. Ok. So you have this leftover sodium chloride. Now, about 70% of seawater is sodium chloride. The other 30% is all the really important stuff. Uh, strontium, molybdenum, magnesium, iodine, all the stuff that the animals need is in the other 30%. So if we use a lot of AB, we have a lot of sodium chloride left over. The sodium chloride raises the specific gravity in the tank and we have to dilute it with fresh water. And when we dilute it with fresh water, we're diluting the sodium chloride and the other stuff. So if we have more sodium chloride at the same salinity, then you have to have less of everything else. Então, a sobra desse, desse consumo do, é o cloreto de sódio. E isso corresponde a aproximadamente 70% da água do mar. Mas conforme tu vai utilizando os elementos A e B, começa a sobrar isto e tu tem que diluir com água doce para manter a mesma gravidade específica, a mesma salinidade. Só que isso faz com que tu perca o balanço com as coisas que realmente são importantes, que são os traços, como estrôncio, molibdênio, potássio, Okay, so if you have more sodium chloride and less of everything else, instead of having 70% sodium chloride and 30% other stuff, maybe you have 75% sodium chloride and 25% other stuff. That's the ionic imbalance that is caused when you use only the A and the B. E esse desequilíbrio iônico corresponde justamente a isso. Como, por exemplo, se tu tivesse, em vez de 70% e 30%, tu ter mais cloreto de sódio vai corresponder a 75% e 25% dos outros elementos. Então, isto é o, des o, o, o desequilíbrio iônico que, é o que ocorre por causa disso. Ok, so now we get back to the balling method. The balling method, you have the part C. And what part C does is to add enough of that other 30% of stuff, all the stuff that's in seawater, but no sodium chloride and no calcium and no carbonates, but everything else that's in seawater, the balling method adds just enough of that to perfectly balance that excess sodium chloride from the AB. E so the qual é a função da parte C? justamente adicionar aquilo que é necessário para que tu mantenha o mesmo balanço com o, o cloreto de sódio que sobrou, mantendo assim este equilíbrio. And Lu, uh, in the part C, we have all the, let's say, the most important minor, minor uh, trace elements, or we have all of them in the part C? Everything that's in ocean water is in the part C, except no sodium chloride, no carbonates and no calcium, but all 70 trace elements and all the minor, minor elements are all in there. Isso era uma dúvida pessoal que tinha sido questionada uh, em algum dos grupos lá que eu estou há pouco tempo. Mais uma vez, confirmando, então, acredito, acho que foi até o Roberto Denadai que comentou uns dois, três dias atrás uh, sobre isso. O Lu está nos afirmando que a parte C do Original Biling Components contém todos os elementos traços que estão na água do mar, todos os 70 e poucos. So, if you balance that sodium chloride with the part C, mm -hmm. the, the specific gravity, the salinity still goes up, but when you dilute it, you're diluting everything 
and you end up right back at 70, 30 percent. OK, so the thing that people have trouble understanding about the balling method is if part C adds magnesium and all the trace elements, then why do I need to supplement magnesium and trace elements? The answer is the balling method does not supplement magnesium and trace elements. That little bit of magnesium, the trace elements in the C balances the rest of the sodium chloride that's left over from the AB. So even though you're adding magnesium and trace elements, you're not supplementing for used magnesium and trace elements. E isso também foi uma das questões que o Roberto que o Roberto colocou. Né? Apesar de tu estar tá mantendo, dosando todos esses elementos traço, ele tá uh, fazendo isso para manter o balanço. Ou seja, uhum. quando tu diluir ele, a água ainda vai ter no balanço, mas ele não vai repor aquilo que foi consumido. Tu ainda vai precisar repor esses elementos traço. Ele faz a dosagem para manter o equilíbrio, mas não para repor o que já foi consumido. Ok, perfectly understood. And how, how we do this supplementation? Ok, Do. so just to, to go back to Jeff's question, just to answer it, um, we can take the balling idea out of this altogether because mm -hmm. balling only supplements for calcium and alkalinity, not for magnesium or trace elements. So in relation to those trace element ionic imbalance, um, the balling method doesn't really come into play. The, the real question is, um, I, I love that Jeff said, how is it fixed or controlled without doing 100% water change? And in my opinion, he's on exactly the right track because the best way to fix an imbalance of these very, very minute trace elements that are barely in there at all is with a water change. If you do a 20% water change, you have fixed 20% of the imbalance. If you do a 50% water change, you have fixed 50% of the imbalance. And so as you do more aggressive water changes, you get that ionic imbalance cleared up that the balling method can now maintain. But uh, they are going to maintain uh, when there is no, uh, no coral growth, let's say. Okay, so with coral growth, um, we know a few things. And one of the very interesting things that we know is that out of the 70 or so trace elements that there are in natural seawater, reef tanks will all use different ones. And so you never know really what is, how much is being used of what. Mm -hmm. However, out of the 70 trace elements in natural seawater, there are 17 of them that will quickly go down in every reef tank, all right? There'll be other ones that'll go up and down, but those 17 will always go down in all reef tanks. So what Tropic Marin does is to make our Trace A and Trace K, two, two products, two solutions. The Trace A contains the seven negative ions of those 17 trace elements. Okay. And the Trace K contains the 10 positive ions of those 17 trace elements. And when you're adding the Tropic Marin Trace A and K to the tank, you are supplementing 17 of the trace elements that we know are going to get used. And you do that according to calcium consumption or, or what, Lou? Well, um, it, it, it's kind of two things. Um, one is that with trace elements, less is more. So you always want to be, if need be, under a little bit of your dosage rather than over too much, okay? okay. Um, the second thing is that you're right. Uh, if you have a 90 gallon or let's say you have a hundred liter system, okay? I'll, I'll try to do this in liters. Um, let's say you have a hundred liter system and every day um, 
you need to supplement with uh, five milliliters of calcium solution to maintain 440, okay? Um, but the corals are growing and you're putting in a certain amount of trace elements. Let's say you're putting in one milliliter of trace elements every day and five milliliters of calcium, okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, six months down the road, those corals have grown. Mm -hmm. And now, instead of five milliliters of calcium every day, you're putting in 10 milliliters of calcium every day. Well, you're right. The one milliliter of trace elements you were putting in now needs to be more like two milliliters of trace elements. So yes, as the calcium consumption goes up, so does the trace elements, and you want to accommodate for that. Então, pessoal, vou, eu não interrompi ele porque seguimos uma linha de raciocínio ali, né? E eu vou tentar transmitir isso para vocês. Então, uh, recapitulando, a parte C ela corresponde para manter o equilíbrio com a água do mar. Tu vai uh, tirando, adicionando água doce, mas não vai repor aquilo que foi consumido. Desses 70 e poucos elementos que contém na parte C, eles uh, foi notado que apenas 17 são os mais consumidos pelos corais. Esses 17 vão muito mais rápido em todos os aquários de Recife de corais. Então, a Tropic tem o produto A e o produto K. No A estão sete íons positivos, sete elementos desses que têm íons positivos. Na parte B tem dez elementos que têm íons que são negativos. Então, essa dosagem é feita de acordo com o consumo do produto e ah, eles repõem os principais. Porém, como o Lu já disse antes, uma troca de água é necessária para que tu tenha um ajuste fino. Se tu trocar 20% da água, tu vai corrigir 20% desse desbalanço. Se tu corrigir 50, vai corrigir 50% desse desbalanço. And Lu, just for me to be sure, you mentioned to me uh, it, the dosage is according the the other elements, the original balling components, addition to the tank, right? Yes, but always with trace elements, less is better than more. Okay. So you always have to kind of remember that. And if you have a question whether it should be three or five milliliters that you're putting in, put in the three, not the five. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want to make one correction from your Portuguese translation. Yes, please. That the A elements are the seven negative ions. Ok. K elements or the 10 positive ions. Ah, um erro. O elemento A são os 7 negativos e o elemento K são os 10 positivos. Eu tinha trocado. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ok. Next question. Muitas vezes, essa pergunta do Ledo, meu amigo lá de Caxias, que foi um dos fundadores do Reef Club, se eu não me sou enganado. Uh, quantas vezes, né, uh, várias vezes foi afirmado que a suplementação de carbono traz benefícios para a saúde e nutrição do cor dos corais? Além, é claro, da já conhecida redução de nutrientes, reduções de fosfato e nitrato no tanque. Uh, podemos uh, uh, especular que, Fontes diferentes de carbono, como por exemplo, vodka, vinagre, açúcar, nopox, têm diferentes efeitos nos corais? Uh, Lu, this is a question from Ledo, a friend from mine from the Caxias City. And uh, his question is, many times has been stated that the supply of inorganic carbon brings benefits to coral nutrition and health, besides the already known nutrients reductions. Can be implied that different carbon sources, example giving vodka, vinegar, sugar, no pox, have different effects on it? Yes, it can absolutely be implied. In fact, Tropic Marin takes it one step further, and we are convinced that the types of carbon 
compounds that you use can promote the growth of very different types of bacteria. Mm-hmm. And so Tropic Marin has five different carbon dosing products that, that are very targeted. Um, and because we really believe that different carbon compounds will promote either all kinds of bacterial growth or only specific certain kinds of bacterial growth. And those are the ones you want to target. And can you please uh, t- tell us uh, which are the types and what they promote? Um, well, I don't, I, I, I don't know that I can say really what are the types and what they promote. What I can say is that um, things like sugar and vinegar, acid, um, and, and um, alcohol, um, these are things that promote the growth of bacteria in your tank these kind Mm -hmm. of carbon compounds. Um, There's lots of different alcohols. There's lots of different sugars. um, And there's lots of different acids. And the type of acid or alcohol that's used definitely makes a difference into which type of bacteria is going to prefer that type of, of carbon compound as food. And so... Um, things in, in my opinion, things like vodka and vinegar and sugar, um, the kind you buy in a supermarket, um, promote the growth of all kinds of bacteria. They're general, uh, foods uh, for all kinds of bacteria Mm -hmm. where the type of alcohols and acids that we put, for instance, in our Alima NP product, which is one of our carbon dosing products, um, are the Alima NP, the alcohol that it contains really does a very good job in making it a preference of the good bacteria that we want to grow to grow and not undesirable bacteria. And uh, how this affects the coral health, Lou? You said, uh, you stated a few times that uh, when carbon dosing, it promotes a better health for the coral. How, how can it be and how, how this happens? Um, it's very interesting. I just did a Zoom session about this. Um, and, and also, if people are interested, the end, the very end of my MACNA 2019 talk, I, I have some graphics that explain this. But the short explanation is that when you do carbon dosing correctly, you are growing bacteria that is very efficient at taking phosphates out of the water, okay? Mm -hmm. One of the advantages of that is that the phosphate level goes down, okay? But the bigger advantage is that the poor coral polyp that really wants that phosphate can't get it out of the water column directly. It doesn't have a good mechanism to do that. Mm -hmm. But what it can do is it's a filter feeder. And if it eats the bacteria that has the phosphate in it, then it gets the phosphate. So the big advantage of carbon dosing, if it's done correctly, is that you give the coral polyp a mechanism to get the phosphates that it desperately needs, but can't get by itself. Então, informações bem bem interessantes. Uh, as fontes de carbono, sim, promovem uh, vários tipos de bactérias, principalmente essas que a gente compra no mercado, vodka, açúcares e vinagres. Porém, existem inúmeros tipos de açúcares, inúmeros tipos de ácidos, inúmeros tipos de uh, formas de carbono, e cada um promove formatos específicos. É, o Lu, ele tratou disso no final da apresentação da Máquina 2019, a gente consegue achar no YouTube, eu vou depois deixar o link aqui na descrição. Uh, e o produto da Tropic, o Alum NP, ele promove uh, uma bactéria específica através da composição dessa fonte de carbono, que essa bactéria ela consome rapidamente o fosfato da água ele tira o fosfato da água. Porém, já que os pólipos dos corais são filtrantes, eles conseguem se alimentar dessa bactéria. 
dessa bactéria específica que é, tem o um crescimento provido por essa fonte de carbono específica do produto deles. E logo o pólipo consegue ter o fósforo, fosfato necessário se alimentando dessa bactéria. And this way we can, we can, it, it, it makes a difference, right? You can keep it down. And, uh, and one thing that I want to ask you, I use it to those uh, red sinopox for my tank. And uh, I had like a, a four hour power down in my, in my tank. And unfortunately, I lost two fishes when normally when there was no carbon dosing, it doesn't happen. So uh, this happens because of the bacterial consumption of oxygen, right? Um, I, I don't know in this particular case because in general, uh, no matter what the, the product would be, uh, unless it's um, uh, the only chemical that I know that really can, can cause a really severe uh, reaction like that is like a calcium acetate. Um, but um, in general, the, the types of carbon dosing that are done, um, you, it's very difficult to get enough biological activity from carbon dosing to lower the oxygen level enough to kill fish. Hmm. Um, so I'm not 100% sure that in this particular instance, that's what happened. It may have been a coincidence um, mm -hmm. because... Uh, In, in my experience, yes, there is some limitation to how much carbon dosing you can do because of, of oxygen. Um, but uh, I, I don't know that I've seen it go to a point where it would actually deplete the oxygen enough to kill a vertebrate, not an invertebrate. So um, uh, I, I don't know the real answer to that, but I'm, I'm betting that maybe it wasn't the carbon dosing that did that to you. Uh, eu questionei ele sobre a questão do alto consumo de oxigênio quando se tem a dosagem de fontes de carbono. Uh, relatei com ele um caso que aconteceu comigo, em que eu tive o horário reduzido, vamos dizer assim, o horário de sobrevida reduzido do meu tanque, e eu fazia o uso de, de carbono, quando já tinha acontecido situações passadas em que eu não usava carbono e durou horas a mais. Uh, e o Lu uh, relatou que Ainda não está comprovado, não, não se pode afirmar que uh, teve um consumo tão grande de oxigênio que poderia uh, matar os peixes. Então, isso é uma, uma anedota que não está não tá comprovada, né? que não, não, tem, não, não se pode afirmar isso. Próxima pergunta, pergunta de João Carlos Passo. Né? a gente vê uma, um, um avanço, né? uma tendência de não se fazer trocas de água ou menos trocas de água no nosso RIF, no nosso hobby de aquarismo. Uh, principalmente isso aumentou com a introdução de testes de CP. Qual a sua opinião uh, sobre a adição, a correção de elementos traço através de análise de CP, além da utilização de um, uma adição de elementos traços e elementos convencionais menor. So we see a developing trend in no water changes, less water changes on the reef keeping hobby, especially with the, the introduction of ICP IOS testing. What is your view on trace elements adjusting according ICP analysis besides the use of a balanced major minor three parts? Well, it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Uh, I, let me talk a little bit about ICP testing, and then I want to talk about water changes. Um, as, as far as ICP testing goes, I work with a lot of people that are having issues in their tanks, and ICP testing has been a wonderful tool to help figure out what's going on in a tank. At the same time, I have one big word of caution from my experience. 
And I always tell people, don't ever go chasing numbers because of one ICP test result. Um, if you see a trend over three, four, five results, then that really has significance. But I've seen all kinds of artifacts. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying that ICP testing is not accurate. What I'm saying is that from each individual result, you want to really look for trends over multiple results instead of being incredibly reactive to one number that you got on one ICP test. Separando as questões, né, sobre os testes de CP, é uma ferramenta maravilhosa. Ele já teve inúmeros casos de pessoas que identificaram problemas com tanque por causa de testes de CP. Já em contrapartida, ele considera que é muito importante que tu tome atitudes corretivas de acordo com uma série de testes, ou seja, com tendências de vários testes, não ser extremamente reativo com um único resultado. Tu tens que acompanhar três, quatro testes e daí sim tomar as atitudes corretivas. Não que eles não sejam imprecisos, mas que ele acredita que essa é uma melhor forma de conduzir as coisas. Ok, so then I'm going to address the last part of the question and then talk about water changes. Um, in relation to adjustments of individual trace elements from ICP testing, um, now we're, we're really talking about a method of, of, you know, keeping the aquarium like, you know, um, and, and um, again, I, I don't like to see people chase numbers. Mm -hmm. I think the ICP test is a great diagnostic tool and certainly very interesting to look at a test once in a while to see what your tank is doing. Um, but the one thing I know is that those 17 trace elements are going to go down in all tanks. And so it makes sense to me to supplement some of those trace elements that I know are going to go down. And if I see something critical on some other trace element, I wouldn't be opposed to adjusting it if I see that critical kind of number on more than just one test. Então, a, o, a ferramenta de CP com análise e manutenção de elementos traço é uma boa, é uma boa, é uma, é um bom método, é um, é um método. Só que ele também tem certeza que os 17 elementos uh, traço principais, aqueles que nós falamos antes, vão cair com certeza. Então, isso deve ser suplementado com certeza. Ele não se opõe em fazer teste de algum ou outro que esteja incorreto. Mas uma afirmação é os 17 elementos traço que eles já identificaram vão cair, vão ser consumidos. And then the last thing on that question is the water changes. <clears throat> There's two things that I love about water changes. Mm -hmm. And when people are starting to set up a tank for the first time and they ask me, what should they do? How should they do it? The very first thing that I say is get yourself set up really well to easily do water changes. I think it's the most important thing when you're setting up a system, okay? Mm -hmm. And the reason is there's two things I love about water changes. One is that if your tank is in some type of trouble and you've done all the testing and you can't figure out what's going on and you're knocking your head against the wall and you're trying to get your tank to do better, it's almost always helpful to do a water change. When there's something wrong with the parameters and you can measure it, it's almost always helpful to do a water change. When there's something wrong with the tank and you can't measure it and everything looks perfect, it can't hurt and almost always helps to do a water change. So water change is the, the best um, uh, initial approach to almost anything. There are one or two things that you shouldn't address with a water change, but a water change is almost always helpful. 
The other thing I love about water change is this. I told you, Ito, I don't keep a reef anymore because I travel too much. Okay. But I used to. And there was very little that was always 100% consistent about my reef. But one thing was always true. When I would do a water change today, tomorrow, my animals always look better. 100% of the time that I would do a water change, my animals look better the next day. And in my world, if there's a button I can push that makes my animals look better, I probably should push that button once in a while. So I'm not a fan of getting rid of water changes altogether. I'm also not a fan of saying you need to kill yourself and do a 50% water change every two weeks. I'm somewhere in the middle, but I am a big fan of doing water changes. Então, primeira coisa quando eu pergunto para eles, quando alguém vai montar um tanque, né? Uh, pergunto para eles o que ele deve fazer. Ele sempre responde com: tu tens que tornar a tarefa de fazer a troca d'água o mais fácil, o mais eficiente possível. Porque isso ajuda muito na manutenção. Ele não tem mais um, um aquário dentro de casa, mas ele já teve. E uma coisa que aconteceu 100% das vezes que ele fez troca d'água foi que os animais eram muito mais bonitos no dia seguinte. Vi uma melhora significativa. Então, se existe uma forma de fazer os corais ficarem mais bonitos, aparentarem estar mais saudáveis, tu tens que fazer isso com a uh, um, um, com uma determinada frequência. As trocas de água servem uh, quando tu tens problemas identificados, mas também quando tu não consegue identificar os problemas. Então, tu tens que uh, fazer isso e deixe, fazer essa tarefa ser fácil. Então, mais uma vez, respeitando as últimas palavras, se tem alguma coisa que deixava os corais dele bonito era fazer as trocas d'água e isso tem que ser feito dentro de, de casa Ó, houve uma pergunta ali do nosso público por que, que o Lu não tem mais aquário o Lu ele relatou antes que ele não tem mais tempo, ele viaja muito, então esse é o motivo I was just explaining because someone made a question why you doesn't keep you don't keep a reef tank anymore and well, I just answered to them that you travel a lot and that's the reason. But I still experiment. Uh, uh -huh. I have I have right now going a um, uh, a little experiment with a mangrove. And oh. I have a little uh, nano aquarium and the mm -hmm. mangrove is growing and I have some Bengai cardinals in there and uh, dotty back and a beautiful little green uh, goby. And um, I've just put in some star polyp to see if I can grow star polyp in the tank. So <laughs> it's not really a reef tank, it's a mangrove star polyp tank. Ok. <laughs> então, apesar de ele não ter tanques, mas aquários, mas ele ainda faz experimentos. Então ele tem um pequeno mangue num nano, e tem bangai, tem uh, gobes, e ele botou agora uns, uns GSP para ver se ele vai conseguir ter uma ter GSP lá dentro. Então é um aquário de GSP com mangue, não é um não é um, um reef. Okay, that's. I was looking to see if I if I was able to uh, share my screen, but it doesn't look like I have. How is the, the ICP testing over there? There is a still a lot of uh, how to say it's a still a polemic topic or it's more settled down. How how people see over there the ICP testing from any brands? I think it's uh, it's it's uh, some people are doing it all the time too much and running after numbers. Uh, some people say it's not necessary, and other people are doing it once in a while to see what's going on in the tank to see if there's some issues. So I think you see the whole range of of approach. But there is still that uh, that type of fight. Oh, ICP are not precise. ICP doesn't measure anything. There is yeah, still this type of fighting over there. Yeah, there's actually a very good article. Did you see the new Coral magazine? We saw the last edition. The last edition one, it was about ICP testing that had the droplet in the in the front page. Oh, yeah, yes. That's the one I mean. Um, <laughs> this one. 
Yes, we saw that. We had made also a special interview on that. And there's a very there's a, a very good ICP article in there. Um, and I also really like the article that Dr. Tim did mm -hmm. right after the ICP article saying about some of the inaccuracies. And again, I am not against it. I think it's a good thing. But I think that the people people that read the article about the ICP testing should also read Dr. Tim's article about how sometimes uh, sometimes the threshold is too small. And so they just say, no, it doesn't have that in it, but it actually does have it. And mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's lots of limitations. And I think Dr. Tim did a very good job of laying that out. Uh, Richard Ross also made a really nice article uh, on reef keeping about, uh, I don't know, maybe three, four years ago, and it was quite yeah. nice as well. And, uh, but um, my question was uh, over there in the US, you believe that it's getting more stabilized because you know, those companies have a lot of time in the market. Yeah. And we see big brands, for example, like Haichai, uh, and uh, also Marine Lab, it's also a huge company, and they are all got into this business. So I, I, it's, it's hard for me to believe that you, doesn't, you don't have a kind of precision or value on this type of analysis. Um, what, what's your personal opinion about it? I, I think it's um, not something that should be done all the time. Okay. Um, because it's very easy when you get numbers like 142.5 to go chasing numbers. And, mm -hmm. and I don't like to see people chase numbers. Um, at the same time, I like to see what's going on in the aquarium. So maybe every six months or every year, I do an ICP test to see the, the components in the aquarium. If there's any question mm -hmm. about a result, I might repeat it. Um, and certainly if something is not working the way I would like it to in the tank and I can't figure out what that is and I've done all of my home testing, sometimes an ICP test can point you in the right direction. That's nice. Uh, então, sim, ele, ele acredita que, que existe dentro, existe três pessoas, as pessoas que fazem direto, que ele acha que é incorreto, as pessoas que não acreditam e as pessoas que fazem de vez em quando para ver se está tudo certo. Então, eu questionei sobre ele, para ele, qual era a opinião pessoal dele em relação a todas essas marcas grandes, de grandes empresas, como por exemplo a TI, como por exemplo a Marine Lab, e obviamente, além da, da, da Triton, que foi a primeira que começou, uh, qual era a opinião dele, se, se, se isso era, era verídico, se, se ele acreditava nisso? Ele respondeu para mim que ah, ele faz esporadicamente, mas ele acha que é incorreto, mais uma vez, que as pessoas ah, tomem atitudes corretivas imediatamente. Né? Como ele relatou antes, tem que ser através de uma tendência e não ficar correndo atrás de números, que isso não tem sentido. Vamos para a quarta pergunta. A pergunta do Marcão, do Help Riff. Mandar um abraço aí para o Marcão, assim como ele mandou na outra live. Uh, o carbo cálcio está gerando um monte de, 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 de questões aqui no Brasil, né? E muitas pessoas a sugerem o uso. Inclusive, eu vou fazer um parênteses, várias pessoas. Eu abri para várias questões em vários grupos, né? E muitas das questões eram referentes a esta aqui que o Marcão tinha elaborado antes. Como que o carbocálcio é diferente do Original Balling Components, a parte A e B? É possível substituir a parte A e B por carbocálcio? Uh, existe a necessidade de uh, dosagem de elementos traço nessa situação? Okay, so this question is from Help Reef. Uh, Marcão is the channel owner, a good friend. And his question is, carbocalcium is having a great impact in the Brazilian market and many advocate its use. How is the carbon calcium different from the original balling components parts A and B? Is it possible to substitute the parts A and B for carbocalcium? And the other part, is there a need for trace element supplementations? Uh, Mr. Lou already answered for us before. So this last one we can ignore. Lou? Okay, so you're right. The answer to the last part is yes, you still have to supplement trace elements. Um, carbocalcium cannot be used in the place of AB 
in the balling method. Hmm. And the reason is that the whole reason you need the C of the balling method is because of the leftover sodium chloride from okay. the parts A and B. Carbocalcium doesn't leave any sodium chloride. Carbocalcium, there's, there's no byproducts. It doesn't raise the salinity. It doesn't create any sodium chloride. It doesn't change the pH. So there's no need for the part C. Mm -hmm. if there's no sodium chloride created. So you can't replace AB with C. Okay. The, the, the theory behind it is correct because the AB gives you calcium and alkalinity and the carbocalcium gives you calcium and alkalinity. The problem is it does it in two completely different ways. And so you can't substitute one for the other. Okay, so you, you would still need to, to supplement A and K, right, from the, from the trace elements, but you do not use anything from the original balling components, only carbocalcium. Uh, correct. Então, pessoal, isso, isso é, realmente foi várias pessoas que me perguntaram, mínimo sete pessoas pedindo para perguntar isso para ele, né? Qual é a resposta? Quando tu usa o original balling components, tu tens que dosar a parte C para tu manter o equilíbrio por causa do subproduto da parte A e B, que é o cloreto de sódio. Só que no carbocálcio é um produto completamente diferente. Então ele não deixa subprodutos. Tu tem que substituir e usar o carbocálcio sozinho. Tu não precisa da, do A, B, o C do Original Belling Companies. Porém, tu ainda vai precisar fazer a dosagem dos elementos traço que é aquele A e K. Então, esta é a grande diferença. Algumas perguntas aqui. Carbocalcio pode gerar um bacteriano. Ok, Lu. So, a few questions just appeared by. Uh, can be the trace elements be added to carbocalcio and be dosed on a single pump head? Yes. Uh, so, um... Are all for reef products. Let me go back. Carbocalcium supplements for calcium and alkalinity. Okay. All for reef, which is a different product, all for reef supplements for calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, and trace elements. Okay. All for reef is literally carbocalcium with magnesium and the trace elements added. Mm hmm. So to answer the question, yes, you still need to add A and K when you're using carbocalcium. And yes, you can add A and K directly to the carbocalcium. The reason you can add A and K to the carbocalcium, but you can't put just A and K together full strength is because if you put them together full strength, they will precipitate but the carbocalcium is very concentrated and you're using the concentrated carbocalcium to dilute the very little bit of the A and K that's going in. So you don't get the precipitation. Então, uh, carbocalcium, tu ainda vai precisar colocar magnésio e os elementos traço. Ponto. Existe um produto que é o Alpha Reef. Ele já tem essa mistura. Ele tem carbocalcio, magnésio, e os elementos traço. É um produto diferente que se chama Alpha Reef. Quando tu usa os elementos A e K, tu não pode misturar eles porque eles precipitam. Porém, tu pode misturar eles junto com o carbocalcio, porque ele já é super concentrado. Tu coloca os dois ali dentro e tu vai conseguir usar eles de forma juntas. Né? Uh, outra pergunta. Vou perguntar primeiro do nosso, do nosso visitante, nosso espectador uh, ilustre, o senhor Júnior Mello. Caso possa perguntar uh, se ele vê o uso dos sais orgânicos substituindo o balin e do reator de cálcio como método de escolha. E se o carbocálcio resolveu o problema de uso em aquários grandes. Okay, so it's, uh, I'm reading it again so I can translate it to you. 
in the usage of uh, organic salts substituting the baling and the calcium reactor as a method of choice. Uh, is, uh, has the carbocalcium solved the problem in the big, uh, in the big aquariums? I believe that he's asking, Lou, if uh, carbocalcium has a good uh, results in huge aquariums. Yes. Uh, and uh, if they substitute uh, the problem, for, because I anyway, know people tend to choose uh, calcium reactors because it's more uh, cost economically. Yes. And uh, has the carbon calcium, calcium solved that problem? Um, uh, if an aquarium is really large, I think if you look at the long term maintenance of the aquarium, a large reef tank, the, the calcium reactor will always win. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the thing that carbocalcium that's new that carbocalcium kind of brought to the table is that it's very concentrated. Um, it's, uh, it's about, um, it's about four times as concentrated as the balling method is. Um, it's, it's, I think 36 times as concentrated as Kalkwasser, as a, as, a, as a saturated solution of Kalkwasser. 36 times? Yes. That's a lot. So it's very concentrated. And that makes it uh, very easy to use in large aquariums. Um, in a really big aquarium, you could even add the powder directly to the flow of water in the sump instead of mixing it into a liquid. I mean, there's lots of ways to use it. Um, but I don't think that over the course of 10 years, it would be less expensive than a calcium reactor on a big tank. Então, uh, o, todo o custo de implementação do de um reator de cálcio, ele foi feito para ser diluído ao longo do tempo. O Lu acredita que isso tem 10 anos um tanque, em 10 anos vai se pagar sim, vai compensar para usar um reator de cálcio. Uh, porém, o carbocálcio é um produto extremamente concentrado. Ele é 36 vezes mais concentrado do que o hidróxido de cálcio, o calcofácer, por exemplo. Então, existem várias formas de tu usar ele. Tu pode, inclusive, despejar ele diretamente no, no, na, na bomba, no SAMP, e está pronta a dosagem. Então, sim, ele é um método muito barato, muito econômico, ele resolve os problemas, porém, com um tempo muito grande, ainda vai, ser, ainda vai compensar o uso, um tempo maior que 10 anos, vai compensar o uso de toda a implementação de um reator de cálcio. Uh, Carbocalcium has been launched when, uh, Lou? How many years this product is in the market? Two years, I think. So it's already from the from the new from the new management. Yes, it it was just at the uh, probably it's a little over two years now because it was just at the transition mm -hmm. that Carbocalcium was coming in. Okay. Uh, se é um produto com dois anos, dois anos e meio, e já foi bem no momento de transição aí entre os, os dois métodos. It had, already uma... been, it had already been developed, but uh, it was introduced after the new owners. Uh, last question from Thiago Costa. Last question from the audience. Uh, which are the difference between carbocalcium and biocalcium? Uh, easy one to answer. Um, carbocalcium is calcium formate, which is an organic calcium compound, organic calcium salt. Um, biocalcium, oh wait, let me go back to carbocalcium. Carbocalcium can be added as a liquid or as a powder, um, and it's extremely concentrated, okay? The only disadvantage to carbocalcium is that because it's a single solution, you're always adding the same ratio of calcium to alkalinity. Mm -hmm. You have no ability to 
make that ratio different than what's in the solution, mm -hmm. okay? But the big advantage to carbocalcium, it's only one solution and it does both things for you. In the ABC of the, uh, oh, sorry, in uh, uh, biocalcium, biocalcium is essentially balling A, B, and C all mixed up together. So since the calcium and the carbonates are both in there, you can't pre-mix it into a liquid and dose it. You have to dose it as a powder to the flow of water in the sump. This to some people is this to some people is a big disadvantage that you can't mix it and dose it. Então, o carbocálcio, ele é somente o cálcio e alcalinidade e tu dosa ela sempre em conjunto. É um único frasco. Não tem como tu dosar mais cálcio ou dosar mais alcalinidade. Já o biocálcio, eles são a, as três partes do balinho, A, B e C, todos juntos, e não tem como tu fazer eles juntos. Então, essa é a diferença. Um é só cálcio e alcalinidade em um único frasco, o outro é todas as partes como do, do balinho que estão lá dentro. Ok. Uh, next question, from Gabriel Lafis. Uh, Poderias nos explicar brevemente por que o Alpha Reef é possível de dosar elementos traço, elementos convencionais sem precipitação? Lou, uh, this is a question from Gabriel Lafis. He's a biochemist. And uh, he is uh, wondering if you can explain briefly to us how the Alpha Reef product is able to supply major and minor elements without precipitation. It's a very good question. And being a biochemist, he'll understand the answer. Um, it's because those trace elements are diluted. We basically already answered the question. It's because those trace elements are diluted by the very concentrated solution of the carbocalcium. And that keeps them from, from the, keeps the positive and negative ions from having an easy time finding each other and precipitating. Uh, where if you just mix mm -hmm. the two solutions together, boom, it would precipitate. But in, in this very concentrated uh, calcium formate solution, it keeps those elements more separated so that they don't precipitate. Então, respondendo a pergunta do Gabriel, é porque nessa solução é altamente concentrada e ele deixa, um, cria uma dificuldade muito maior para precipitação. Né? Então, isso aí é o que, que prejudica, né? isso daí é o que, que, cria, que cria essa dificuldade. Então, é por isso que não existe essa precipitação. Sexta pergunta do, do meu amigo Paulo Mallard. Né? O quão essencial, na sua opinião, é necessário nós uh, provermos a comida adicional aos corais, como aminoácidos e plâncton? Uh, quão grande é a diferença de, de, vamos dizer assim, de acreditar unicamente, de se basear unicamente nos resíduos de comida e excrementos de peixes? Lou, this is a question from Paulo Mart, a good friend of mine. How essential, in your opinion, is it required for us to provide extra food for corals like amino acids and plankton? How much is the, this difference from trusting only on fish poop and food residues? Another good question, and it's I'm going to qualify my answer a little bit because it depends on how much fish, how many fish you have, and how much you're feeding. Um, if you are very, very uh, uh, restrictive in your feeding and you don't have a lot of fish in there, um, then you need to feed more. If you have a lot of fish and there's a lot of food going in, there's gonna be a lot of waste for your corals to, to feed on. The one thing that I would say is this, your corals do not have the ability, no matter how good your lighting is, your corals do not have the ability to make enough food to be healthy in the long run without particulate food that they filter out of the water column. 
that's really good to hear from you because it's quite polemic, you know. A few people, they advocate that uh, even when we have uh, people like uh, Eric Bonnerman saying uh, again, uh, saying word uh, uh, concording with us. And uh, that's really good to hear it from you. So então, I'm a big proponent of feeding uh -huh. and how much you have to feed depends on how much stuff is floating around in the water from the other feeding you're doing. Então, isso eu cheguei a comentar com o Lu, porque eu já escutei de vários amigos dizendo ah, os corais não precisam de alimentação. Uh, Lu fala com grande veemência que não existe a possibilidade disso, que no, no andar do caminho vai ter uma degradação na saúde. Os, os corais precisam de alimentação, eles precisam de detritos para filtrar. Agora, se tu vai fazer alimentação ou não, depende de quantos peixes tu tem, depende de qual alimentação que tu vai colocar. Se tu tens uma boa carga orgânica dentro do teu aquário ou não. Então, sim, os corais precisam se alimentar. E vai depender se tu precisa de alimentação ou não, de acordo com a quantidade de peixes, de acordo com a quantidade de comida que tu coloca no tanque. Ok, let's go for the last one. Aí a última pergunta é do Vinícius Mantovani, que está de aniversário hoje. Meus parabéns, Mantovani, <risos> muitos anos de vida. Uh, os uh, aquários nano estão ficando cada vez mais e mais populares, né, que são uh, mantidos com trocas d'água. Isso pode causar uh, um desequilíbrio iônico com o andar do tempo. Quais são as sugestões uh, que tu tens para evitar esse tipo de problema? Lou, we already answered this question, but uh, I'm going to ask it, and uh, let's hear once again from you. And uh, the nano reefs are becoming more and more popular, which are mostly kept with water changes. Uh, this might cause an ionic imbalance as time goes by. What's your suggestion to avoid this type of problem? Okay, so I'm not exactly sure what um, he's asking in relation to water changes and ionic imbalance because if you do lots of water changes that actually cures and gets rid of the ionic imbalance mm -hmm. i want to make one point of distinction though no matter how small the reef is if it's a a, a healthy growing reef unless you're doing a 90 water change every week you should not be able to maintain calcium, alkalinity, uh, magnesium, good numbers with just water changes. Mm -hmm. The animals should be using more. Um, as I said, if, you've, if you're doing 90% every Saturday, maybe then you could get away with it. But if you have a nano aquarium and you do a 50% water change once every two weeks and you're able to maintain your calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium, your reef is not growing and your animals are not happy. So even a nano reef should need the addition of, of additives for supplementation. Nós já tínhamos tratado dessas respostas antes na, lá no começo da, da live, né? Então o Lu, ele adicionou alguns pontos ali. Em relação aos aquários nano, mesmo se tu fizer uh, as, as TPA, se fizer 90% de TPA, tu não vai conseguir manter uh, os níveis ótimos para uma boa saúde do animal, porque vai existir esse consumo de cálcio de carbonatos. Então, uh, fazer, por exemplo, 50% a cada duas semanas, tu vai ter problema também. Então, tu tens é que uh, dosar tu vai precisar fazer a adição desses elementos no nano. And uh, when focusing on zoanthids and soft corals, this uh, would, might not be a big problem, right, Zulu? With, uh, uh, if you're staying with uh, LPS and, and soft corals, there's a better chance that you can maintain things with water changes, but it still is true. LPSs are encrusting they they make calcium carbonate um in a in a complete tank of soft corals only that's a different story that you could maintain but if you have lps that are in there and growing aggressively 
water changes alone, unless you're doing a lot of them all the time, high percentage, shouldn't be able to do it. Então, um coral, um aquário nano com, uh, com trocas de água, com trocas parcial de água, com zoantídeos apenas e corais softs, vão ir. Agora, se tem já LPS, eles vão ter a necessidade do cálcio e do os carbonatos. Então, a, é essa a grande questão. Se tu queres ter, tu vai ter que fazer a dosagem no teu aquário nano. Tu não vai conseguir manter somente com trocas de água. And Eu vou... Said, Ido, don't leave out the point. I'm a big fan of water changes. <laughs> um, I just, I'm not a fan of water changes for element supplementation, but I'm a huge fan of water changes. Então, só para deixar claro, ele não é um fã de, de fazer troca de água para repor elementos, mas sim é para fazer a correção dos problemas, tá? Uh, let's go for one or two last questions. Let's go for one last question. I'm going to choose it now. Uh, pelo aquário, pesquisa também equipamentos. Ok. Let's, let's finish it with a more holistic question. This question is from Claudio Vidal. He is uh, also the owner from a big brands importer here in Brazil. He's an importer from Max Pact mm -hmm. and uh, also Aqua Forest. So his question, in the last 10 years uh, of uh, reef keeping, we saw a lot of uh, development on water chemistry, a lot of research and also new uh, equipment developments. Lou, what do you believe that the future will bring us on the reef keeping hobby? Wow. That's, that's uh, a big question. Eh? <laughs> well, you know, I think it's a really good point that I think the, the hobby has changed more in the last five to seven years than it changed in the whole time before that, that I was in the business. And I've been in the business a little over 23 years. The the technology is really coming into its own now. And I think that the current trend that you see toward um, um, automization of the tanks so that everything is working on its own and you're monitoring everything that's going on and the, the equipment is good enough to know that if the number drops this much, I add a little bit more, and it learns it's, it's on a amazing. daily basis. I think that this trend is only going to continue. And, um, you know, it's, it's when I started in the business 20 something years ago, it was very difficult to keep a reef tank. And not everybody was growing stony corals. And, and it was a whole, you know, um, Aptasia was considered a good thing because it actually grew in your tank. Um, you know, this is, uh, uh, we have come a tremendous distance in this hobby. And in the last five years, the technology end of it is really showing what it can do. And I think that trend is going to continue and it won't be too long before you'll have a tank and you'll, you know, you'll, You'll put some kind of a box on the back or something, and it'll send every piece of information that you need to your watch or your phone and automatically make adjustments to follow whatever instructions you give it. I don't think that day is going to be far away, um, and, and um, I, I think it's a good thing. I think that more people are being successful keeping reefs today than they ever have than, than ever in history. And I think that's a good thing. Nos últimos 23 anos que o Lu já está na indústria, ele nunca viu um desenvolvimento tão rápido quanto os últimos 5 a 7 anos. Hoje a gente já tem equipamentos que fazem a medição e corrigem as dosagens daquilo que precisam. O Lu estava se referindo, obviamente, a, por exemplo, o Trident da, da Apex, da Neptune Apex. E uh, ele acredita que essa, essa tendência não vai mudar que logo, logo nós caminhamos para um futuro em que tu vai ter o teu aquário vai colocar uma caixa atrás dele e todas as informações vão vir para o teu relógio do que tu deve dosar e do que tu deve fazer então ele realmente acredita que 
o desenvolvimento só vai avançar, só vai ter uma taxa de crescimento mais rápida a partir de agora. Lu, anything that you're expecting from the market to see in the, in the next years? Anything that might be a game changer? Boy, if there ever was a time that you couldn't predict what's going to happen in the market, it's right now. Uh, you know, I think with the whole COVID situation and mm -hmm. lockdowns and uh, who knows what's going to happen in ports. I mean, I just think it's not, uh, it's not a time you can predict, you know, anything. Um, but I think that, that, uh, you know, you will see uh, uh, another trend that you're going to see is towards aquaculture and conservation, because that whole end of it is becoming such a, you know, such an issue. And that, that I think is going to be a, is going to look completely different than it than it looks today you know but it they're all good changes and i'm just excited about the hobby it gets better and better o mercado tá muito difícil de ser previsto principalmente com essa questão da covid e dos uh, e dos acontecimentos que estão que estão tendo né mas ele acredita que o grande desenvolvimento e que a gente vai ver uma mudança no nosso hobby vai ser na questão de aquicultura principalmente por causa das proibições de importações e restrições que estão tendo ao longo do mundo. Então, aí ele acredita que nós vamos ter uma, uma, grande, uma grande mudança. Uh, Lu, eu quero te agradecer. Muito obrigado pelo teu tempo. Nós ficamos muito felizes pela chance de estar aqui conversando contigo. Tu é um cara simpaticíssimo. Né? Eu, eu devo dizer que a tua apresentação na máquina foi incrível. Uh, clareou muitas ideias de várias pessoas e que puxa vida, muito obrigado pelo teu tempo e o teu conhecimento é, é incrível, ficamos muito felizes em te ter aqui por essa uma hora, uma hora e meia Lu, uh, I want to say thank you once again for getting your time to talk with us you are really uh, really, uh, how to say that in English a sympathetic person really nice talking to you man And uh, your, There you go. I had a good time. <laughs> and your magnet presentation, it was marvelous. You cleared out many, many difficult to understand points. Oh, thanks. And uh, man, I really wish that we can have uh, future times. Well, well hopefully, hopefully like that. who knows? Maybe Macno someday you'll have uh, similar, you know, types of things that maybe I can fly down to Brazil for. Oh, that would be nice. You, you would be king now because exchange rate is just crazy over yeah. here. <laughs> so... yeah, except I'm not getting on a plane right now. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, any message for the Brazilian audience? Yeah, keep up the great reef keeping. Enjoy it. It's getting better and better. Um, and uh, um, I hope that uh, we can get this around Brazil a little bit and um, and maybe I can have people from Brazil calling me too. <laughs> Ok, então como mensagem para o Brasil, continue um bom trabalho, vamos focar no aquarismo né? e né, continuar mantendo os riffs, e ele espera um dia que a gente consiga se encontrar e, e vir até aqui. Lu, thank you very much. Pessoal, muito obrigado, até o próximo episódio do Super Riff aí, tudo de bom para vocês, hein? Just a second, Lu, so I can finish down the, the interview. Lou, thank you very much, man. You're really, really simpatic.